I wanted to start with a question, my lesson with a question. Is this building holy? Some people said yes. Some people said no. And if you said no, I get that. Sometimes when you think of something holy, you might think of the first temple of Jerusalem that, that Solomon built. And, and that was holy because it not only represented the presence of God, I think we understand that the presence of God was there. And that would make it holy, right? Yeah. Now, if someone said in regards to this building, so that, that was the no, if you said yes... That's really what the message is about today. What would make it holy? It's people. More than that, purpose. The title of the lesson this morning is Building Sacred Space. And it really is a focus and a Bible study that helps us to understand really the, the purpose for what we're doing as a congregation with our building project, what we're trying to accomplish with the addition of the building. It's not just so we have a nice big place that's new and that has all the latest gadgets and technology, perhaps. That's not why. We want to accomplish something for God with this space. And when... So that would make then kind of anything sacred, right? If it's committed to God's holy purposes, that would make it sacred. That might make your family room sacred. I know some people who lead Bible studies in their home. That makes that family room sacred. Some people use their vehicles in the in, in doing ministry, that would make my 1961 GMC van sacred. It has 400,000 miles on it. But it gets terrible gas mileage. Just. It is the purpose for which our lives are committed that make them holy, that make them sacred, that would make this building sacred. And even a pagan king understands that. And in the book of Ezra is where we'll be taking some of our points this morning. I wanted to look in chapter 6. Uh, it's, it's an interesting read. The book of Ezra has a lot to offer us in the perspective of, of what happens when God's people decide to be committed to do God's work. Well, you're going to run into resistance. You're going to run into friction. There are going to be people who don't disagree, who don't agree with what you're doing, or people on the project who disagree with what you're doing. So all of that is going to be there. There will be people who will try to stop the work, people who will complain about the work, people who uh, won't cooperate with the work and have all kinds of good reasons about why they won't cooperate with the work. But this pagan king... Uh, King Darius, or Darius, uh, there was uh, Cyrus the Great, the king of Persia, uh, allowed Jews to go back to the land and began to rebuild the temple and, and inhabit the land. There was a period that the work had to stop because another Persian king said, uh, the work must stop. The city of Jerusalem has always been a problem, and we don't want to rebuild the city. And so he stopped it. And then this is after that. This is where uh, there was a, a letter sent to the king of Persia about these people in Jerusalem. And actually, they, after a while, they just said, you know, we don't care what the king of Persia says. The Jews, they said, we're going to build the temple. We're going to do what God told us to do. And so another letter was sent. Now Darius is the king of Persia. And he understands the purpose. And, and uh, he is actually quoting uh, some things that Cyrus says at first. 
in verse 3, it says, in the, first year the, uh, in the first year of King Cyrus, he issued a decree, a decree concerning the house of God in Jerusalem. This is chapter 6, verse 3. Let the house be built as a place for offering sacrifices and let its original foundations be retained. Its height is to be 90 feet and its width 90 feet with three layers of cut stones and one of timber. And then he goes on and talks about it. So he gives some specifics about what the temple is supposed to look like. Uh, he's, he's keeping in, uh, in line with God's instructions on what the temple is supposed to look like. But uh, verse 3, uh, rebuilt as a place for offering sacrifices. And then at the end, he says, he says, uh, verse 9, Whatever is needed, young bulls, rams, and lambs for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, or wheat, salt, wine, and oil, as requested by the priests in Jerusalem, let it be given to them every day without fail. Why? So that they can offer sacrifices of pleasing aroma, uh, a pleasing aroma, uh, to the God of heaven, and pray for the life of the king and his sons. So t- to them, this temple, to, to, to Cyrus, and, and Darius picks up this idea, is a place where God, God's sacrifices are offered, where prayers are made, where the purposes of God are fulfilled. I guess that's basically what I, what I wanted to say. The purposes of God are fulfilled in the building. And that's what makes it Holy, that's what makes it sacred. Sacred is anything that is connected with God or dedicated to a religious purpose. Just using that word in general context. But it it also has to do with, um, it's also equated with the word holy. And the word holy um, is to make holy, to treat as holy, to set apart as holy, to sanctify. And and that's the word that we most often click on, and and that is uh, set apart, that it's reserved for a special purpose. And we understand that these are religious purposes. These are purposes of God, purposes for divinity. That's what holy and sacred mean together. This relates to something that is set apart for the use of God, for the purpose of God. John 17, 17 tells us that uh, that that's God's goal for our lives, to sanctify them, to set them apart by the truth. God's word is truth. So that's the purpose of the word coming into our lives, to set us apart. And connected to that is everything in our lives. What in my life, when I become a Christian, is to be set apart for the use of God? Everything. Everything. My life is sacred. My life is dedicated to the work of God. Everything in my life, even my van, it's all separated out for the use that that God can use. Everything we have, therefore, becomes uh, in the category of being able to be used by God. Everything we have. So everything my life touches, if my life is sanctified for the work of God, everything my life touches, and that's the way it should be. We understand that that is a totally committed life. Everything in my life is committed to some aspect of my faith, or that's the way it should be, right? That's the way it should be. It's not always that, and we are at different places of growing in our faith to where All the different aspects of my life are committed to the work of God. But that's the goal. The goal is that our lives will be set apart for the use of God. And that's what makes them sacred. That's what makes them holy. And that makes, therefore, that makes this place that we're in right now, maybe not holy as we can think about the presence of God, Although some would argue that if a Christian is in the building and the Holy Spirit is in the Christian, then God is here. I I, I get that. 
And, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but I'm mostly talking about the purpose. Because we do God's work in this building, that's what makes it sacred. This building, this addition, uh, for many, many years, has been committed to the purpose of God. And that's what makes it sacred. And no, we don't have to have the building for that. When God separated Israel as his people, he gave them a place for worship. What was it? What was it called? Oh, you Bible... Tabernacle. Yeah, it was a tent. It was something that could be moved from place to place. And, and David, as he was thinking about how God had blessed him, he said, it's not right for me to have this nice house, this nice palace to live in, while the ark of God lives in a tent. And so what did he want to do? He wanted to build a temple, a permanent structure For the work and the presence of God. Now, did God say, no, I don't want you building stuff? Basically, God said, you know, I've never needed a place to be God. I never asked you to do that. But in the end, that building was built. The temple was built. Solomon built the temple. And God never asked for it to be built, but he accepted it as an expression of faith and as a place for him to reveal his name. And his presence lived in that building. So God was okay with it, but he didn't ask for it. He didn't demand it. He didn't say, thou shalt build me a temple. He never said that, but he accepted it. And I think that's significant. God didn't command us to build this building. But I know he's blessed it. I know he's done some amazing work in here. And I have an idea that he's going to continue to do amazing work through this group of people who are sanctified for his purpose. And therefore, the things that we touch are sanctified for his purpose. That makes it sacred. And there are three convictions that I want to develop this morning that make this sacred space. And the first conviction is that we understand that we are acting on behalf of God. Look at, in Ezra again, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. The Lord put into the mind of King Cyrus to issue a proclamation throughout his entire kingdom and to put it in writing. That is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Whoever is among his people, may, be, uh, may his God be with him, and may he go to Jerusalem in Judah and build the house of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. Let every survivor, wherever he lives, be assisted by the men of that region with silver, gold, goods, livestock, along with a free will offering for the house of God in Jerusalem. So many of the family leaders of Judah... And Benjamin, along with the priests and Levites, everyone God had motivated, prepared to go up and rebuild the Lord's house. All their neighbors supported them with silver articles, gold, goods, livestock, and valuables, in addition to all that was given as a free will offering. King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and had placed in the house of his gods. So, do you think these people realized that what they were doing was a work of God. And they were fulfilling the act of God through their returning to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And 
And, and it's significant for us to understand that, that what we're doing isn't just our idea. And certainly, oftentimes, because of the way people sacrifice, and you've seen people sacrifice, and I've seen people sacrifice in this building, they're doing it because they're committed. It, it's not easy to operate on behalf of God, because he calls for a lot. He, he's, he's a very demanding God. He wants it all. And I'm okay with that, because I know what that, uh, what that looks like. I know how that blesses my life. When I'm committed to God, good things happen. When I'm fully committed to God, really amazing things happen. And so God is motivating his people. And not only we, we read that he is, he also provides those who are motivated. He's provided all of the, the material goods, the gold, the silver, uh, the articles. He gave them the things that are to go into the temple when it's done, the things that Nebuchadnezzar had taken. God provides for those that he motivates to do his will. And, and that is shown in, in how we operate and in the, the passage that was read this morning by, by Jerry um, I, I, think it's, um, I think it's significant for us to, to see that to do the Lord's work, to fulfill his sacred purposes in our life, it's going to take resources. Uh, verse 68, just wanted to read that again. After they arrived at the Lord's house in Jerusalem, some of the family leaders gave free will offerings for the house of God in order to have it rebuilt on its original site, based on what they could give. See, we've, we've read that in the New Testament. That idea that we give according to how we've been prospered. Based on, on, on what they could give, they gave 61,000 gold coins, 6,250 uh, 6, pounds of silver, 100 police, priestly garments uh, for the treasury, uh, to the treasury for the project. Um, uh, people gave as they could. And I thought that was interesting. My understanding is that at least some of what they had was what was given to them before they left Persia. But they gave what they could to support that work. And that's, kind of, that's what I've seen for the la in the last week or so here. And not just the last week or so. I think that's how we operate. We give this group of people, the Lakeview congregation, the Lakeview family, gives what they can for the sacred purposes. Because we understand that God has asked us to do something. God has asked us as a church family to lift up Jesus and to, to equip people to serve and to build lives that honor Him. And, and that, that is significant. And, and I want us to capture what happens and kind of like the blessing of what happens when we do that in chapter 3 of the book of Ezra, verses 1 through 5. By the seventh month, the Israelites had settled in their towns and the people gathered together in Jerusalem. Joshua, son of Zozadak, and his brothers and the priests, along with Zerubbabel and the son of Shealtiel, and his brothers began to build the altar of God's uh, of Israel's God, in order to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So they're doing this according to the plan. They set up the altar on its foundation and offered burnt offerings for the morning and evening on it to the Lord, even though they feared the surrounding peoples. Um, well, I didn't even catch that. Um, the, doing the work of God provided risks for them. They celebrated the festival of booths as, pres as prescribed and offered burnt offerings each day based on the number of specified the, the number specified by ordinance for each festival day. After that, they offered the regular burnt offering and the offerings for the beginning of each month and for all the Lord's appointed holy occasions as well as the free will offerings brought to the Lord. So they're beginning the work. They're beginning to do the work by which they were called, to offer the sacrifices of God, to, to carry on the holy purposes of God 
through this project, but is the temple built yet? No. No. As we read on in verse 10, it says, When the builders laid the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests dressed in their robes and holding trumpets, and the Levites descended from Asaph, holding cymbals, took their positions to praise the Lord as King David of Israel had instructed. They sang with praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, uh, for he is good, his faithful love to Israel endures forever. That's, that was their song. That's what they sang. We sing that song too. Set fast love and Lord never ceases. Then all the people gave a great shout to the Lord because the foundation of the Lord's house had been laid. No building yet, just a foundation. But they gave a shout because why? Because they were fulfilling the work of God through their lives. And they weren't even done yet. They still had a lot to do as far as this building program went. But many of the older priests, Levites, and family leaders who had seen the first temple wept loudly when they saw the foundation of this house. But many others shouted joyfully. The people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shouting from uh, that of weeping because the people were shouting so loudly and the sound was heard far away. This is an expression of exuberant and highly emotional gratitude. Some people say that when the priests who saw the old temple saw the foundation uh, began to cry, it's because they were sad. And there's a reference to something that, that later on. But I don't think that's why they were crying, because it wasn't as great as the original temple. It wasn't even built yet. It was just the foundation. Why were they weeping? Why were they praising? Because the purposes of God were being carried out by them. Uh, they, they were seeing again the the things that honored God, the expressions of their faith. And they shouted, and they praised, and they wept. All of the things that are natural responses to something that moves you deeply. Did you feel the hesitancy when we clapped after Leonard was done giving his announcement? Did, did you? It's like, ah, can we clap? Yes! We can clap. This is... we've. Together, we've accomplished a great thing. Let's be excited about it. Let's praise God about it. And let's weep, not in sadness, but in joy. Because our lives, our lives are expressions of the work of God. Think about that. Your life as an expression of the work of God. That's going to make you shout. That's going to make you praise and I know you've had those times where you've just been so overwhelmed with gratitude that you cry. Because your life is an example to the work of God. The second conviction is that, that the Spirit is going to be working through us. Again in Ezra chapter 5, we see mentioned a couple of, of other individuals. Uh, Zerubbabel is kind of the key guy at this point, uh, the key man, the point man, the uh, project manager, I guess we'll call him. And, and then in chapter 1, or chapter 5, verse 1, it says, but when the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, son of, son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them, Zerubbabel, son of Shealti, and Jeshua, son of uh, Zozadak, began to rebuild the house of God. And so this was the motivation. The king of Persia had told them to stop because Jerusalem was a problem for earlier overlords, and they didn't want it to be a problem where that 
king of Persia at the, at the time. Stop the work. But Haggai and Zechariah show up on the scene and they began to, they say no. Let's, they encouraged them. They prophesied. They taught them. And they, so they got back to business. They got back to building. And, and on here is Haggai. Um, Haggai uh, one of the things that, that he said, he says, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Because it's, it's, it's nothing there yet. Doesn't it seem like nothing to you? Even so, be strong, Zerubbabel. This is the Lord's declaration. Be strong, Joshua, son of Zehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people in the land. This is the Lord's declaration. Work, for I am with you. The declaration of the Lord of hosts. This is the promise I made to you when you came out of Egypt. So this is the problem. This is what God's people always know. My spirit is present among you. Don't be afraid. And that's the same message to us today. Sometimes as humans, we can't see what good we might be accomplishing. We can't see that this, it's audacious to think that we can work on behalf of God because we can't always see we can't see into the future. We don't, we don't know. But the promise has always been by faith. That you work because I'm with you. My spirit is with you. Don't be afraid. Don't complain. Don't grumble. Don't give in to the, the distractions. And that's actually where we're going next. Oftentimes we do give in to those distractions. Focus on the work of the Spirit. Now, sometimes we, we struggle with understanding the Spirit. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole religious movement that says the Spirit is all about uh, speaking in tongues and being just exuberantly spontaneous. But from what I read in Scripture and what I've seen in the lives of people is the Spirit isn't always obvious. He's always present. But He's not always obvious. Because He works through people. And, and perhaps it's our own limitations that we place on ourselves where others don't necessarily see the work of the Spirit. But, you know, the Spirit works inside you. The Spirit works in circumstances. The Spirit prompts. And that's not always visible. The Spirit is like the lighting on this building. You can't see the lights that are highlighting this building. They're not, the light isn't supposed to be seen. What's supposed to be seen? The building is supposed to be seen. The Spirit highlights the work of God. And so you don't see the Spirit. Hopefully, you see the work of God. Hopefully, you see the purposes of God carried out. The good things. That's the focus. That's what is most important. And it really is the presence of the Spirit within us that makes this sacred space. So that has to be one of our convictions. We have to believe deeply that God, what we're doing is an act of God. But he doesn't say, you go and do it on your own. He gives you the spirit to animate and empower to do his work. God never leaves us alone. We often leave him behind, but he never leaves us alone. And what often is problematic are the distractions that we encounter in life. And as if you read through Ezra, you see all kinds of distractions. You see the distractions of the people, the Samaritans who already live in the land. They... They come and approach Zerubbabel and say, hey, we want to help. And Zerubbabel says, no, 
this is our gig. And, and I don't know if I was Zerubbabel because I'm kind of one of those go along to get along sort of people. I would have said, come on. Yeah, join us. Let's. So Zerubbabel must, must have had some reason why the Samaritans weren't involved in the project. And actually, that was problematic for the rest in the days of Jesus, that separation, that, that ethnic separation was still there. So I don't know the answer to that. But I know it was a distraction. Because the detractors, the Samaritans, were able to bring the power of government down on the people doing the work of God. And they did. And they said, stop. The king of Persia said, stop. And they did for a while until Haggai and Zechariah showed up and said, the Lord is with you. Work hard. And so they got back going. And then that led to another circumstance where another letter was written. And that's what we read, uh, the, the letter from Darius uh, quoting Cyrus, Cyrus said, this is good. And so Darius let the project continue. So they didn't allow the distraction. So sometimes there are these physical distractions that, that we face where someone is physically trying to alter and change what we're doing. And that can happen in a number of ways. It can happen through grumbling and complaining. It can happen through uh, throwing your weight around. It, it can happen through being uh, in charge of the political strings. Uh, I'll take your money away. I'll take your funding away. You, th- this is going to stop. But they would not let it stop. And then there's some other distractions. And, and these are found in chapter 9. And maybe... This is what Zerubbabel was concerned about. After these things had been done, the leaders approached me and said, the people of Israel, the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the surrounding peoples. Maybe that's what Zerubbabel was concerned about. The negative cultural influence on the work of God whose detestable practices are like those of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Boabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Uh, The people that lived around Israel were wicked. They were evil. They were sinful. They they had, uh, their lives were characterized by sin, and we, we can't look at this any other way. Uh, we have to be careful how we deal with people who are stuck in sin. But that doesn't mean they're not stuck in sin. That doesn't mean that God doesn't want to show them mercy. And that they don't need to change. Indeed, Israelite men have taken some uh, of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons... Uh, so that the holy seed has become mixed with the surrounding peoples. The leaders and officials have taken the lead in this unfaithfulness. When I heard this report, I tore my tunic and robe and pulled out some of the hair on my head and beard. That's a way to show that you're really serious about that. This is serious. And sat down devastated. So we won't read on, but you can read on if you'd like. And this was, they were giving in to their cultural values. They were uh, pressured, they were expected. Um, And again, maybe that's why Zerubbabel said, no, Samaritans, this is our project, this isn't yours. And I know maybe that seems kind of offensive. But God cares about who's influencing us. He cares if cultural, if cultural values are shaping the things that we do. Shaping the way we look at things. Because it's those cultural values that create the problems in society. Oftentimes, the solution 
to a sinful problem in culture, they wouldn't call it a sinful problem. They'd call it something else. They'd define it some way else. But oftentimes the solution to a sinful problem in culture is more sin. You ever notice that? Watch it. Pay attention to it. Satan is purposeful. He's all into that Trojan horse stuff. We're going to sneak it in. The people in Ezra's day put away their foreign wives. They took action against the invasion of cultural values into the work of God. And and that's, I mean, that's serious response. That's seriously dealing with the problems. But that's, I think that's God's will, part of God's will for our lives. To um, not separate ourselves from culture. You know, even Paul says that, you know, you have to be in the world. I'm not talking about the things of this world. I'm talking about the compromised Christians that are a part of the Christian community. God expects us to deal with that. To be aware of the distractions of, of culture. Um, because we see our, commits, our commitments as sacred. My, my decision to follow Christ is a sacred decision. I am going to uh, see the seriousness of my actions because I want my life to be committed to the purposes of God. And I want every aspect of my life, I want the things that I'm involved in to contribute to the purposes of God, which means I'm going to have to cut some things out. It means I'm going to have to give some stuff up. Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. And never forget that the distractions to that which is sacred is is evil. Paul says in Romans 16. Verse 19 says, The report of your obedience has reached everyone. Therefore, I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise about what is good. Now listen to this. Yet innocent about what is evil. What does that mean, innocent about what is evil? It means I'm not guilty of participating in it. I am wise about what is good. That is what's pushing and motivating and directing my life, is what is good. But when it comes to evil, I'm I'm innocent. I don't participate. And that doesn't mean I'm better than anybody else. It means I want my life to be sacred. And these things distract from that. These things take away from that. So I am going to protect against that. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Don't don't give in. Because Satan is history. But it doesn't mean he's not effective. That doesn't mean he's, he's not going to try. And think about it. If he can distract you from your life being a holy purpose for him, for God, if Satan can distract you from your life being a holy purpose for God, what is he going to change? He's going to change the course of your history. And believe me, he would like nothing more than that. I like how Paul ends that section, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. The things going on as, as Zerubbabel leads the people, as Ezra comes on the scene and begins to 
to lead the people. These are all things that were prophesied by Jeremiah. And if you want to look that up, we don't have time to read it. Jeremiah chapter 51, 10 through 11. Jeremiah says, I will stir the heart of the king of Persia or something like that. But this is all God's doing. And so that's, that's why I'm committed. I believe that what we're doing here is God's doing. The existence of the Lakeview Church, the things that they've done, the things that they will do in the future, that's God's doing. And I'm committed to that. A lot of uh, congregations, you may have heard this before, in, in urban areas, have... Um, Closed doors and moved out the suburbs because they're chasing their members out into the suburbs. That means they're neglecting where God put them. And that just, uh, that tells us a lot of things, but that makes us think about that God put us here for a purpose. We have a lot of things going on in our outreach to the community. That's part of our purpose. We are close to the, to JBLM, or a mission point in that regard, to the military community. So many things that we do, we, we are providing, as we work together, we are providing a space, a sacred space, for God to do his work for the purposes of God. I think that's a worthy cause. I think that's worthy for you to commit your life to. I think it's worthy for you to commit your resources to. Because I think it's going to pay off big. And I'm not just talking about interest rate. I'm I'm talking about that statement that God makes at the end of our lives where he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with what you have. And so, I'm going to give you all you need.